Well, I don't get a chance to hear Cindy teach much, but every time I do, I am like wowed. In fact, she's so special. I don't know how she wound up with me, but you know, we all have our crosses to bear. Um, all right. Well, that was a wonderful, exhortive teaching on the role of wives in marriage. And now I'd like to direct uh, my time to the husbands and their role in marriage. So uh, if you'd all turn to Ephesians 5, I want to key in on some verses that are directed to the husbands. Of course, you know these very well, but let's read. And I'm going to read them to the NLT because we do know them so well. But Ephesians 5, verse 25, where Paul says, Husbands, love your wives. Just as Christ loved the church, he gave up his life for her. Verse 28, in the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as they love their own bodies. For a man who loves his wife actually shows love for himself. No one hates his own body, but feeds and cares for it, just as Christ cares for the church. Now, and again, I'm directing my comments to the men. So, guys, in the New Testament, there are three main passages that speak of the responsibilities of husbands to their wives in marriage. Ephesians 5, which we just read, along with the parallel passage in Colossians 3, and then in 1 Peter 3. In looking at these three passages, three main responsibilities emerge. Three things that a husband must be to his wife. Guys, this is our identity as husbands in marriage. A man in marriage must be a leader, a learner, and a lover. So let's look at the first one. A husband must be a leader. Ephesians 5 verse 23 says, For the husband is the head of his wife, as Christ is the head of the church. God has ordained that the husband is to be the head or the leader of his marriage and family the one who was ultimately responsible to make the final decisions that impact his family. Now, that's important because, as somebody said, this is important because you can't have a two-headed monster running your family. Somebody has to have the final word. Somebody has to be the tiebreaker. And so the husband and wife are to approach each important decision, yeah, not where you want to eat dinner, but we're talking about substantive decisions that affect your marriage in a pretty substantial way and your family and so on. So here's the deal. Husbands and wives are to approach each important decision with mutual input and prayer. And if their marriage is healthy and their relationship with God is spirit-filled, they will almost always agree on a decision going forward. But if they reach an impasse, then the husband has to make the final decision. Now, in 45 years of marriage, I can only think maybe of once, maybe twice, where Cindy and I had been praying about something. I forgot even what it was, but we had been praying. It was a pretty important decision. And we couldn't really come to an agreement. And so she said to me, honey, on this one, I'm just going to submit whatever God leads you to do. Now, no pressure there. <laughs> I mean, if you have half a sense about you, what that does is it says to you, this woman trusts me. I mean, she's placing all her trust on my decisions. I better get this right. There are times when I've said to her, you know, honey, we're disagreeing on this. You might be right. I could be wrong. Let's pray a little more about it. We've done that. But I think when a woman submits in that way to her husband, and it's on him now to make that final decision, I think that makes him a better man. 
because he wants to make sure he doesn't mislead his family. He doesn't do anything to jeopardize, you know, the blessings God has given them. Guys, the real problem in all too many Christian marriages is not the unwillingness of the wife to submit. It's the unwillingness of the husband to lead, to accept and carry out his God-given responsibility as leader of his family, of his marriage. A lot of guys can't be bothered. They know what God has said about being the spiritual leader in their family as a Christian man, husband, but they really can't be bothered. And so just, you, you decide, you decide. Keep pushing off the decisions on to the wife, and eventually she becomes the de facto leader of the family. She's, not that she's usurping his authority or wants to take control. She just, it's thrown in her court. And guys, is it, is it any wonder after you do this for a few years, she doesn't respect you, she doesn't come to you first, she doesn't look to you to be the leader, and then guys are saying, well, why doesn't my wife respect me as a leader? Well, why should she? You have not taken that role seriously. Now, sometimes a woman will have a hard time submitting to her husband, not because she's rebellious, because she's afraid. What does that mean? Well, she knows that he has made several decisions that have impacted their family in a negative way financially. He hasn't prayed. He really hasn't done any research on whatever this thing is that he's thinking about doing. He just kind of wings it, rushes into an important decision, and it blows up. And this has happened several times. And now she's terrified because if he makes one more bad financial decision, it's going to bankrupt them. And then what's going to happen to her and the kids? So guys, make sure that your, your wife is having a problem submitting to you. Make sure it's not you. It's easy to say, well, it's her. She won't submit. She won't submit. Examine yourself. Maybe there's a reason for that, and it's not her fault. So be careful. One more thing, though. And, you know, again, this is such a big topic, marriage, you know, workshop. We could spend weeks. But, look, we're trying to kind of condense everything. Um, I've already got in my mind maybe win at your marriage part two. So we'll see going forward. Again, that N-word is giving me trouble. But anyways, one more thing. When it comes to a husband being a leader, it's important to understand that in the eyes of God, listen, a true leader is not a dictator. He's not a dictator in God's eyes, and the woman's not a doormat. True leadership in God's eyes always manifests itself in humility, servanthood, and by being an example of Christ's character. That's why Paul says women, wives, submit to your own husbands as to who? The Lord. We men need to be following the Lord. Jesus would never ask a wife or tell a wife to do a whole bunch of stuff. Again, this documentary we watched on the Duggars. It's a lot of people that use the name of God to justify all kinds of wicked behavior. And, and ladies, if, you're, if your husband wants you to do something that you know God has told you not to do, gosh, I don't want to be base. Let's watch pornography together. Obviously, that's not something God wants you to do. And so in those situations, you must obey God rather than men. So this is not about a blanket command to submit to him in every area. That's not what God does. But, but as Cindy pointed out, and I've met guys who, you know, Christian guys, but they thought they were some of the most spiritual that ever lived. But you can always tell a carnal man. And one of the ways I can tell a carnal husband is how he's always beating his wife over the head with submit, submit, submit. I knew a guy like that. 
And I told him, I said, your emphasis on what she has to do indicates you are not walking with God properly. Because if you read down a little further, yes, wives submit to your own husbands in everything as unto the Lord. Her responsibility is to submit. What is yours in Ephesians 5? To die. Sacrifice yourself for her as Christ did for his bride. So she has the responsibility to submit. You, yours is to die, to self, and to this weird notion that because you are an authority, you're the dictator and she's the little peasant subject that has to agree to everything you want. So first of all, a husband in marriage is to be a leader. And that doesn't mean an oppressive leader. It means a servant leader. Secondly, he's to be a learner. Learner. 1 Peter 3, verse 7 says, Husbands, dwell with your wives with understanding. A husband is to understand his wife. He's to study her. These are in good ways. Not to control her, but he's to, if he wants to better serve her, he's got to know her. He's got to study her. He's going to learn about her. He has to be a student of his wife so that he can better serve her and meet her needs spiritually, physically, and emotionally. In other words, guys, our wives are to be our primary ministry. Our primary ministry. One pastor put it this way, suddenly, quote, A wife should never be, never be viewed as a sexual object. There must be a broader understanding. A godly husband will seek to understand his wife's moods, feelings, needs, fears, and hopes. He will listen to her with his heart, demonstrate love, and stimulate joy, end quote. So, you know, maybe we should add another L word. Probably goes with the topic of being a learner. Another L word, and that would be the word listener. A husband should be a listener of his wife. Now, men, let me just say this. When your wife comes to you with something that is bothering her or frustrating her, it doesn't even have to be about you. I'm sure we do enough, give them enough grief that they <laughs> worry about. But if she comes to you with a, 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 an issue, a problem, something that's bothering her, frustrating her, you know, um, maybe it's at work or something. And if she begins to tell you what's bothering you, don't cut her off in mid-sentence and give her the answer to the problem. Is that such a rookie mistake? <laughs> such a rookie mistake. Young men, listen to me. She doesn't want an answer. She wants you to listen and respect how she's feeling. Now, when she's done sharing... And, and if she comes to you in the middle of a program you're watching, don't be rude and try to keep watching the program while you're trying to listen to her. Give her the respect she deserves. Shut the TV off. If it's something that's really bothering her, shut the TV off and look her in the eyes and let her speak. Let her tell you what's on her heart. Now, if after she's done sharing, she asks you for your input, you know, what do you think? What do you, what do you think should be done here? Then you give her your input. Otherwise, just empathize, don't educate. Our wives are smart enough to figure out the problem. They just want somebody to listen, and we are to be listeners to our wives, right? So, guys, as husbands, we are to be, we are to, be to our wives first a leader, which includes, uh, as secondly, a learner, which includes being a listener, and finally, a lover, a lover. In Ephesians 5, verse 25, Paul says, Husbands, love your wives. You know, guys, I think it's interesting that husbands are commanded to love their wives, but interestingly, there is no such direct commandment to the wives to love their husbands. We are commanded directly, Husbands, love your wives. 
Now, I know in Titus chapter 2, Paul says the older women should teach the younger women how to love their husbands and kids and so on. I get that, but it's not a direct command, is it? Why is that? Well, the reason is because husbands represent Jesus in the marriage. And 1 John 4.19 tells us we love him because he first loved us. When a man loves his wife like Christ loves the church, listen now, guys, she will reflect that love back to him. In other words, her love for him will be a response for his love of his love for her. I came across this true story I thought was very interesting and speaks directly to what we're talking about. It's a story that came uh, out of uh, American culture in the uh, early 1800s. It goes like this, and I quote, It has been said that an eastern newspaper man went down south prior to the Civil War to interview southern ladies. He had heard that they were more feminine, desirable, and submissive to their husbands than were their counterparts back east, and he desired to know why. After his interviews, he wrote an article stating that, and I'm quoting him now, the difference with Southern women is Southern men. His article continued to describe how Southern gentlemen treated their wives and daughters with total respect and honor. In other words, the wives were cherished, and the women's response was to live up to their reputation as being noble ladies, end quote. I thought that was interesting. If your wife is a reflection of you guys, if her attitude towards you is kind of ugly, she's reflecting something back. How's your attitude toward her? How is it that you speak to her? Um, do you make her feel important, cherished? And respect it. Now, guys, as we come to Ephesians 5 and, God, and God's command to the husbands, it's really all ver uh, built on the command in the first part of verse 25 where Paul says, Husbands, love your wives. And then Paul proceeds in the verses that follow to define how husbands are to love their wives. And again, we spent a lot of time in this when we taught out of Ephesians 5. So I'm just going to touch on these. And if you want to go online, you listen to the full teaching, okay? I want to give you the flavor, though, all right? So we are to be lovers of our wife. Husbands, love your wives. And then Peter, uh, Paul goes on to explain what he's talking about. First of all, he mentions uh, we are to love them willingly in verse 25, the beginning of the verse. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church. Let me stop there. Jesus loves his bride, the church, willingly and enthusiastically. Ladies, I know you'd say amen. You don't have to, but I know you'd say amen. And I've heard women say this. I'll paraphrase. If my husband was, a, is as, was as attentive to me after we got married as he was before when he was courting or dating me, I'd be a happy wife. Why is that? Well, somebody put it this way. I'm not going to excuse that behavior completely, but somebody put it this way. Men are conquerors. You know, the old women are nesters, men are hunters. That baloney, I don't know. Who came up with that? There might be some truth to it. But it's in a man's nature to conquer. Okay? And so he tends to conquer various aspects of his life. First, he conquers school, college, gets his degree. Next, he sets his eyes on or sights on marriage. He conquers marriage. He finds a gal, marries her. Then he moves on to conquering the corporate world or whatever. The problem is you got a wife that you've now conquered, and the poor woman is wondering where you are. I mean, it's like amazing how some guys, it's like been there, done that, you know, one guy told his wife, she said, why don't you ever tell me you love me anymore? 
I told you when we got married, if I, take, if I don't take it back, it's still in force. Told you when we got married. The day we got married, I told you I loved you. Now, I think it's probably a phony story, but <laughs> there's a lot of truth to that. Maybe there are some guys out there that feel that way. I don't know. So we are to love our wives willingly, enthusiastically. Secondly, we're to love them sacrificially. Again, verse 25, husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church in what? Gave himself for her. Again, you know this, but the word love there is the word agape, a word used most often in the New Testament to speak of God's love. And it's not a feeling per se. I'm not saying feelings don't accompany agape love. But that's not the focus of this Greek word. The word agape is, uh, speaks of a love that is a commitment, a commitment, um, a sacrificial commitment. Um, you remember what Jesus said. No man takes my life from me. I give it freely for the sheep. He's our example. We are Christ in the marriage. We need to understand that. Jesus gave himself for us willingly and sacrificially. Again, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he what? He gave. That's agape love. Uh, he gave. It's a giving love, a sacrificial love. He gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in Jesus would not have to perish in hell, but would have everlasting life. I heard a teaching on marriage years ago by a young pastor who encouraged men. He said, look, practicing sacrificial love does not come naturally because what comes naturally, as we are controlled by our fallen nature often, is loving ourselves, putting ourselves first. God's love is sacrificial. It means putting others first, starting with my wife. He said, but I was really convicted that I wasn't doing that. So I began to pray. And God began to give me opportunities to die to self, to put my wife's needs before my own. And as I began to do that, I began to really get into it. I began to really sense God was really in this, giving me the strength to do it. And in the process, because you can't give without receiving, and that's not the motivation, but you give God's love. And, wow, it just... The Spirit of God just fills you up. He says, guys, get into this. Get into what it means and what it feels to love your wife sacrificially. Putting yourself last, her first. Doing what she wants to do. You know? Um, just the things that are things that she really loves to do. Die to self and do those things with her. Guys, God's love is totally selfless and sacrificial. Uh, it's also supernatural, as we talked about last night. So there's no way you can. There's no way you could reproduce an attribute of God like God's love from a fallen heart. You can fake it. You can try to counterfeit it. It's going to be like a cheap knockoff. But but you know. But if you really want to love your wife the way God wants you to, the way Christ loved the church, you have to draw close to God. You, you have to pray because, again, last night we talked about how when you got saved, Romans 5, verse 5, tells us God poured his love into us through his Holy Spirit who moved in. And now we have access to God's love, agape love, but we don't have to use it. We can still be selfish. Unbelievers, they don't have access to it. I mean, they try, and there's a lot of folks that are very kind and loving. But only a Christian can really love the way God loves on a regular basis. Number three, you gotta, we got to love our wives practically. Men, your love for your wife needs to be demonstrated in very practical ways. Uh, Paul uses a very simple illustration to drive this home. Verse 28. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh. No, no one ever hated their own body, but nourishes and cherishes it just as the Lord does the church. Look, 
Guys, we all love our bodies. Some guys a little too much. But we all love our bodies. How do I know that? Because we take care of ourselves, right? We take care of ourselves. Um, when the body's hungry, we feed it. When it's tired, we, 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 you know, we rest it. When it gets sick, we pamper it, okay? Uh, we take good care of ourselves for the most part. But Paul says, look, you need to take care of your wife that way, practically, in a, in a practical sense, right? That's what we're talking about. Um, I mean, think of practical ways, guys, you can show your love for your wife, just practical ways. There are some women, they feel loved with, as some have called, acts of service. You know, acts of service. Different people have different ways they interpret love. Some, it's physical touch. They want to hug. Uh, others, it's different ways. In one book I was reading, the author said that there are some women who really feel loved when um, my mind just went blank. That's happening a lot. Um, when you show her little acts of kindness. What does that mean? Now look, I, I'm just going to give you an example of what I've experienced in my life. Not to make you think, wow, what a great husband. Uh, you know, I've fallen short in a lot of other ways. But one of the things, um, well, I'll tell you this first one first and then I'll tell you something else but when the kids were small and Cindy was home and she cooked a nice meal we'd all eat kitchen now was a wreck because it was she cooked all day so my job was to take the kids into the bathroom and give them baths you know get them all ready for bed while she cleaned the kitchen that was just a little routine that we did um, I've tried throughout the course of our marriage to just do little things. I mean, just take the garbage out on a regular basis. One of the things I put in my heart, um, because she would go to retreats and conferences uh, when we were younger. Now she teaches retreats and conferences, but, and she does a great job, doesn't she? And, uh, but, but, but there were times when she attended maybe a weekend conference, a pastor's wife's conference. And I purposed in my heart never to have her come home to a house that looked like a bomb had gone off. Kids or no kids. That was just my commitment, right? I mean, the last thing, guys, you want for your wife is like when Jesus was up on the top of the Mount of Transfiguration, right? How incredible that was to be up there in the presence of the Father. And what happened when he came down into the valley? Who was waiting for him? A demon-possessed kid that his father had brought. I didn't want my wife to go home to demon-possessed kids that were... I stuffed chocolate into them all weekend because, you know, get away. don't bother me. Just have a, have a Hershey bar. And so she comes home to a house that looks like a bomb went off. Kids running around, bouncing off the walls. I didn't, I didn't want her to come home after a spiritual high into a situation where I was going to rob her of everything God had given her. I wanted her to come home and go, oh, thank you. Kids look good. They're still alive. I appreciate that. You know, I mean, the house is clean. So, you know, however you need to, um, to do this is, is important. Um, <laughs> anyways, the next one is we need to love our wives unconditionally. Unconditionally. Again, verse 28. So husbands ought to love their own wives, skip ahead, just as the Lord does the church. Paul said that husbands need to love their wives just as the Lord Jesus loves his bride, the church. How does God love us? Well, sacrificially, agape love, but also unconditionally. Unconditionally. In other words, God's love is not performance-based. He doesn't love us because of what we do for him or how long we read the Bible every day or pray. Or, or things like that. There are religions, and, and, and some of them are Christian religions, uh, that put a lot of emphasis on what you do for God because it kind of earns his favor in their minds. It's not biblical. 
God's love is not performance-based. That's the love of the world. The world loves others because of what they can do or how much they perform or whatever. It's all based on the deservedness of the one receiving the world's love. And I know that there are men who say things like, well, I'll love her like Christ loves the church when she starts, you know, respecting me or stops nagging me or, you know, takes better care of the house and so on. So it's conditional. I'll love her when she performs better at tasks around the house and whatever. Guys, let me just tell you this. If that's how you're feeling, please understand that's not unconditional love. That's not the kind of love that Jesus loves his church with. The love of the world only gives to those who are deserving, whatever that means those who have earned the right to receive love. Again, it's performance-based. Can I just say this to you? And this is something that goes both ways. Men do this to their wives. Wives do this to their husbands. What if God loved us based on our performance? What if he only loved us when we deserved it? It would be hard to relate to him, wouldn't it? It would be hard to draw close to somebody, a, a God that was always watching you in the sense of, are you measuring up today? I couldn't live like that. That's why the Bible makes it a point to say, perfect love casts out what? Fear. God loves me perfectly. His love isn't based on if I get it right today or if I blow it. He loves me unconditionally. Even when I mess up, know this, God still loves us. We, when we mess up, he still loves us. And you know what that should do? Because we know God's love is unconditional. It should make us want to love him and draw closer to him more. Performance-based love drives us away, breeds condemnation when we don't measure up. But agape love, unconditional love, is I love you. Phil, you don't think I knew everything you were going to do wrong before you were, I ever made you? Don't you think in eternity past, I know every sin you were going to commit, and I still loved you, and I still invited you to be my son. And I know that. Although the devil, you know, he gets us thinking, well, maybe it's not that way, but we know better. But because of God's unconditional love, it makes me want to love him more, which means it makes me want to serve him better and love him more and, and live in a way that honors him more. And guys, the same is true with your wives. Wives, the same is true with your husbands. We talked just a minute ago about the man who tends to make decisions hastily. Well, all of us men have done that. And sometimes they blow up these decisions. How great is it to have a wife who comes alongside of you and says, Honey, I know you meant well. I know it didn't work out the way you hoped. But I love you. We'll get through this together. I still respect you. I know you had the right heart. Wow. That's powerful. Because that makes a man, if he's a good man, want to be a better man, a better husband. Because, wow, this woman really trusts me. And I need to go to God. <laughs> I need to, to get in his presence. Lord, what do you want me to do here? Because I, I don't know really. So guys, we are to love our wives willingly, sacrificially, practically, unconditionally, and finally permanently. Now what I'm about to say, I, in no way I'm using this to condemn anyone who's been divorced. That's over. Sometimes divorce is legitimate in cases of physical abuse and on, or ongoing sexual uh, where he or she is um, being unfaithful continuously. So sometimes divorce is legitimate. And sometimes as people look back on divorces they've endured, um, 
As you get older, you think, well, maybe I could have really worked harder to make that work. But it's over. It's under the blood. It's, God's not holding it against you. But I, I just want to speak to the ideal. Uh, very few of us ever really live up to the ideal on a regular basis. But let us it's here in the scripture so that we can at least have something to shoot for. In Ephesians 5, verses 30 to 32, we read, For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Now, the word, key word there, and let's, let's keep it specific to marriage. It's got a whole eternal security perspective with regard to salvation attached to it. But right now, let's keep it to the immediate context of marriage. The key word is the word joined in verse 31. Uh, that's a word that refers to a strong bonding together of objects and often is used to signify gluing or cementing two things together in a permanent bond. Folks, marriage from God's perspective was always intended to be permanent, a lifelong bond that only death would break. That's the ideal. In Mark 10, Jesus himself quoted from this verse in Genesis 2, verse 24, when he said, For this reason the man shall leave his father and mother and be glued, if you will, glued to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. If you have any woodworkers in the room, you know. They have developed wood glues today that are stronger than the wood. You glue two pieces of wood together using some of these new wood glues, and then you try down the road to pull those pieces of wood apart, you're going to have pieces of the wood pulled out of the wood, and the glue joint remains intact. And that's kind of how it is when God glues two people together in marriage. What God has joined, let no man, what? Separate, pull apart, divorce is the Greek word. Karatzo. What God has cemented, let no man divorce. But people get divorced. And here's the thing. When God cements two people together and makes them one, and they try to rip that union apart through divorce, chunks of their heart are going to be pulled out, and they're never going to be quite the same. I know people try to put a good face on it. Hallmark has even come out with happy divorce cards. I mean, it's ridiculous. Our culture trying to, to validate something as painful as divorce. Malachi 2.15, I believe. It says, God speaking, I hate divorce. He doesn't say, I hate divorced people. He says, I hate divorce because it hurts people I love. It tears their hearts apart. Sure, I can put them back together with a new person in their life to be married to. My uncle divorced a woman. He's with the Lord now. He wasn't saved. Uh, he told me this story. My uncle was a great guy, got saved, was a wonderful, godly man. But he was married way before he got saved to a woman. And this woman, my aunt, you know what? I'll just say it. She was terrible. Just terrible. Yeah, I loved her, but wow. She was the biggest nag and the worst wife putting him down constantly, berating him, emasculating him, just every chance she got. Finally, he couldn't take it, and he divorced her. Met my, well, he's with the Lord, but the woman he married, um, our Aunt Martha, who was a very godly woman, Cindy's very close to her, married her, and they had a wonderful marriage. Well, they both got saved. But after they'd been married for 25 years, I was with him one day, and he was talking to me. He says, you know, I love your Aunt Martha with all my heart, but there's still a part of me that wishes 
my first marriage hadn't ended in divorce. There's always going to be regrets. You cannot be one with somebody. We're in the most intimate kind of a oneness and tear each other apart in, through divorce and not have chunks of your heart missing. It's just not possible. It's better in the long run, I think, to try to work it out. Again, sometimes divor divorce is unavoidable. But I think too many young couples especially rush into it because they think, yeah, I don't need this. Um, you know, I'll find somebody better. I don't know. I'll say this to you. Again, Mark 10, verses 8 and 9. Therefore, what God has joined, let not man separate. Again, the word separate, karatsu in the Greek, is a word that means to divorce. And so an accurate uh, paraphrase would be, what God has joined together, let not man divorce. And when Paul commanded husbands to love their wives, the Greek word, again, was agape he used. And agape is, a, is always, is almost always. It, it's not really a holy word. I've had pastors say that they didn't have a word to describe God's love in the Greek, so they invented a new one. That's not right. Don't take everything we pastors say as gospel. We mean well. We try to study to make sure we give you accurate information. But that word is used in Luke 11, I think around verse 46, but there might not be a verse 46 in Luke 11, so it wasn't that. The other day I'm teaching and I was talking about the volume of the book is written of me. I said, you know, Jesus said that in, in Acts 40, verse 7. I'm, go, I'm, I'm thinking to myself, as I was listening to it, I, I had to edit it for the radio. Acts 40, verse 7. Look, I think I'm a heretic. I had to cut that out. S Psalm 40, verse 7. But in Luke 11, Jesus said, of the Pharisees, they love the chief seats in the synagogues and at the feasts. And he used the word agape. Now, years ago, when Nancy Missler was studying to write her book, The Way of Agape, and she came across that in the scripture, she said, it so took me back. She said, God, you've made a terrible mistake. I understand where she's coming from, although God never makes a mistake. The mistake was believing people who tell us things that we don't check out for ourselves. The word agape means to love something unconditionally, passionately, fervently. God loves us that way in a good way. The world loves things that way in a bad way. But most always that word is used in the New Testament to describe God's love. Okay? which is a selfless, sacrificial love. But guys, as our culture has moved away from God's love more and more to self-love in marriage, the result is that more and more couples, even Christian couples, are ending their marriages for almost any reason. This is what was going on in Jesus um, in Paul's day. Remember Matthew 19, verse 3? The Pharisees also came to Jesus testing him and saying to him, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? Because that's how they, where they were coming from. The rabbi said, You don't have to have a reason. Just give her a written certificate of divorce and let her go. Some of the things that they pointed to, well, if she burns the eggs, I'm sorry, puts too much salt on the eggs, burns the food, doesn't respect her, uh, her mother-in-law, talks to a man in public that's not his, her husband, she can be divorced for any of these reasons, and many others. We see that in our society, where you have a lot of people who have a very low view of marriage. It's like the Jews had back in Jesus' day. They had come to a point in their society much like the one we have come to in ours, again, where people don't have a high view of marriage. You know, we still make a big deal out of the wedding, right? Most people still get married in church. They deck it out. It's wonderful. They invite family and friends for this wonderful day of marriage, their wedding day. 
but it really is a formality. They exchange vows which include, I will be faithful to you for the rest of my life, good times, bad times, sickness, health, until death do, do us part. And they mouth the words, but they don't really intend to live up to those words in their practical lives. I mean, most people don't really intend to be faithful to their, remain faithful to their spouse if the opportunity presents itself for them to have an affair. And when they say, until death do we part, they really mean, until divorce do we part. Now listen. You're thinking, is there any hope for a damaged marriage to be restored? The answer is yes. And we're going to look at our final study and show you how. Why there's hope and how you can apply that hope into your marriage. All right? So we'll leave it there. And uh, come on back, another 10-minute break.